Hi everyone, welcome to the Virtual Amicus and I'm Jay Nudha. So today we are celebrating our 50th episode. That's right, 50 episodes today and uh, we'll be shooting the 50th one. And the topic is very interesting. It is conversations beyond law with a lawyer. Now the Virtual Amicus, I started on 30th of May 2021 and I started this YouTube channel as a platform that allowed young passionate lawyers to not only give presentations on legal issues, topics, legal topics of their choice, but also to share their experiences, narrate their journeys, share the lessons that they've learned, because the only way to get rid of a problem is by solving it and not by avoiding it. So the whole idea was to highlight uh, the importance of having a mentor, because we unfortunately never had one in law school. Through this platform, the idea was not only to create legal awareness, but also to solve legal issues that were both basic and complex, that baffled us or that continue to baffle us. So the endeavor was to do it in the simplest of the ways so that it's easier for everyone to understand and comprehend it. So we sincerely hope that this channel becomes an integral part of the lives of not only lawyers, but also of law students and general masses. And the journey would not have obviously been possible without the overwhelming support, uh, support and response that I got from such brilliant members of the legal fraternity. So we sincerely hope to continue this level of endeavor and I'm determined to build this platform into a virtual space that will help everybody at any given point of time. So as I mentioned that today we are celebrating the 50th episode. So we have with us a very special speaker, the Micus for today's session. Uh, he needs obviously no formal introduction, but then format of our uh, show, format of our channel is such that we have to give an introduction before we start with the session. So today we are joined by Dr. Vikas Balia. Uh, just to give you all a brief introduction about our micus for today's session, Dr. Balia is a lawyer and a rank holding chart, uh, chartered accountant with a passion for sustainable living ideas and a wide exposure to several areas of law, jurisprudence, finance, management and policy making. As a man who likes to live between different worlds and who has a deep empathy for different perspectives, he brings a unique perspective to his core professional work as an arguing counsel or when structuring a deal. Uh, finding solutions and resolving uh, stalemates in court and outside of it, he has an experienced human healings and faults very closely. Uh, we ask Mr. Balia wears many hats of that of a lawyer, an investor, an academician, and a social entrepreneur. As a lawyer, he founded Legal Sphere, a full-service law and consulting firm, and appears as a counsel before courts as well. As an investor, he is invested in the distressed asset industry affordable housing and knowledge process outsourcing. He sits on the board of Edelweiss uh, Asset Reconstruction Company, India's largest ARC in Indalco Limited, world's largest aluminum rolling company, Equoro so short, uh, Sureties Limited, a, a pioneer in sureties and guarantees in India as amongst others. And he also mentors a few startups as well. Uh, as an academician, his PhD has been in the area of securitization and lectures on issues which sit at the, influence, uh, the confluence of his various areas of work, he founded the Desert Leaf Foundation with his sister and a close friend to undertake projects of lasting value and dedicated to reviving the cultural and social landscape of Jodhpur and surrounding areas. At the forefront of his endeavor has been a not-for-profit tennis academy and Kitabo, one of the world's largest children's literature festivals. He is also a founder trustee of Udhav, a trust uh, for the benefit of children diagnosed with cancer, and the Jodhpur Initiative, a trust which acts as a think tank for the development of the city of Jodhpur. He believes that a good story heals all wounds, and good story brings new life. A good story is the best teacher. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Balia, for taking our time on a busy working day. I know uh, being one of the busiest councils, uh, you know, we have a different hat all together, but taking our time for our channel and for a special segment that marks the 50th episode uh, on the virtual amicus that we managed to somehow record in record uh, time. Uh, it would be lovely to have your valuable insights on the topic, which is quite interesting. Um, so, Mr. Valia, any, uh, Dr. Valia, any introductory words you wish to say before we start with our section segment? Thank you, Jay. Uh, I think, you know, the CV sounds more flattering than the man himself. Uh, uh, I don't know uh, if, if that justifies being here, but uh, let me tell you, I'm never busy. 
and I'm always available for a for a good chat. Thank you so much there, uh, Dr. Balia. Now, uh, the stage is set, the floor is all yours. Over to you. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, when, you, when, when Jai asked me to speak on something, I said instead of uh, talking on a subject of law, in any case, that's not my core competence. Uh, people who know me, know me that. Uh, I don't think if, if, if that's what, uh, really uh, makes me what I am. And when we said that let's talk beyond law, uh, I think Jay asked me that why you want to talk beyond law. You know, uh, I believe that they're all uh, young lawyers. I would like to call myself a young lawyer, but I know that's the next generation there. You know, the next generation always stands on the shoulders of the last one. And since they're already standing on our shoulders, they're at, they know Whatever I know on the subjects, they already know that and probably more, uh, much more than what I do. So, you, you know, if there was an interaction on, on core subject, I would be the one listening and hearing all of you. But uh, what I can do is, uh, since I'm the one who's standing below, I can share my experiences. That would be possibly more, uh, more than uh, the next gen, at least for now. And I always believe that um, that a lawyer or law is always part of the larger life and humanity. So there are more things, and there are things beyond law, uh, which is a shared experience. And that is what will effectively make us even better lawyers or understand better law. Uh, we should always uh, you know, take time out. And I think it's more fun to be talking things other than law as well. So, uh, Jay, would you have anything specific uh, in terms of questions, or uh, would you want to uh, ask? You know, want me to speak on 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 what we're discussing? <clears throat> so, if you could throw some light on the role of uh, judiciary in a robust, in a very strong democracy, how can the judiciary, uh, being one of the most important pillars, contribute? To start with, because we all are members of the legal fraternity, so it'd be really nice to have your take on the role and participation of judiciary. Yeah, so I, you know, that's a that's a that's a complex question, but if I were to you know see it from the perspective of us as a fraternity, and there's always a debate on on what's more important pillar of of a democracy, whether it's legislature or executive or judiciary. And what really is the role of judiciary? You know, that's unless we understand that, we really would not know the position and realize the importance of it. And then also work in accordance with the role that the judiciary is supposed to play. So, you know, in different forms of governance, disputes have always been there. And uh, what disputes come to the adjudicating body or authority, you know, it could be in different forms of governance, there are different uh, forms. But uh, the role that they play is vastly different. And the most expanded role a judicial or an adjudicating body, you know, may call it anything, uh, is, is what makes a democracy a true democracy. So let me explain, you know, uh, there are, uh, it's not that non-democratic setups, you know, did not have a judicial system or an adjudicating forum. It always used to be there. Even the king used to, you know, decide cases, or he used to have a whole uh, a, a body or 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 a bunch of people or systems where they would decide disputes. But you know, in every system, in every civilization, you have broadly three kinds of of disputes, and which go to an adjudicating body. Uh, and when we understand these three, we'll realize why the judicial system in a democracy is so important. So one is where two individuals or two citizens have a dispute over something. So that is what we normally call of the civil litigation and the criminal litigation that you talk of, right? Now, those mechanisms, those adjudicating bodies were always there in every system, even the king, even the even the most 
uh, despot of a monarch used to have the system because he wanted to have some kind of dispute resolution. The citizens would not uh, would be at peace, and only if they're at peace, then they would be able to help the state. So that's an adjudicating there. What all you need is a neutral person who will be able to decide whether it's in accordance with law, or it's in accordance with equity, or it's in accordance with the principles that are laid down for by the immediate contemporary society. Could be anything. At the end of the day, if it is a, a consistent system, which is applicable for everyone, it's okay. And that those mechanisms were always there. And that is one role that the current judicial system also discharges. Normally, for these matters, you will go to the original forums. You may call them trial courts, you may call them district forums, you may call them lower judiciary, whatever. But the idea is between two citizens, any kind of dispute, civil, criminal, and I'm not getting into the jurisprudence aspect of whether any crime is against the state or not, but, but the beginning point is it is between two citizens. That is one kind of a rule that was always there and that does not distinguish our judicial system with the, uh, with the earlier uh, times. Now, there are two other functions. The second is where the judiciary advises the government on critical legal aspects or policy making decisions. In a contemporary form, we see that you know the Advocate General of the Supreme Court could advise the government or they could come to them for, for, for advice. That's the second role. So you would have the a lot of uh, you know when times when the uh, governance was intertwined with the religious body, you would have Qazis who would be advising the, uh, the king or you would have people who are supposedly well versed with the regulations or what should be done and what should not be done would be advising the, the king or even if it is not a monarchy, if it's even a different form of governance or a limited partial democracy, you would have that. Now the role of advisory is again not so critical because you can have experts and independent that can be outsourced and they can, you know, it is any government or king in any case would want that role to be played by someone. So they would have people advising. Currently, in the current system, the judiciary has been given that role. Of course, we haven't seen it much in use, but it is there. But it is the third thing, which is the hallmark of a democracy, which is where a citizen could go to an adjudicating body with its grievance against the government and actually fight with the government. Fight is a slightly strong term, but let me say whether they can have any dispute, they will get it resolved by an independent third person who understands and knowledgeable on these situations and decides disputes between the government and the citizen. Your whole entire writ jurisdiction that you see is today a manifestation of the same, where you can go to a constitutional court and say that my rights have been infringed by a state or a state, uh, uh, a body which has got the color of the state. That's the peculiar function where no governing uh, system other than a pure democracy has had that system. Do you think you could go and fight against the state in any other system? No. And that is what is the unique feature of this of not just India, but any true democracy. And you could go and fight against the state without, a reper without repercussions or without the state or executive coming after you. And that those decisions, whether it is against the state or its, its functionaries would be implemented. So, you know, the, the first two functions that I spoke of is not what is what makes a distinction feature that were always available in every governing uh, method, every political theory will say that that's a function which the state has to discharge. But the unique feature of going against the government came in with the democracies and that is what has made them so free. Everything flows from the fact, you talk of freedom of whether it is speech or trade, what is it? It is that the government can't curb it. Between two citizens, in any case, one should not impinge on the other and as long as that is there, it was always available. You could always do your trade, you could always do anything as long as you were not against the state. 
Now that feature is there with the constitutional courts and the primary function of the judicial system is protecting or providing an insulation to the citizen against the state or the government. Let me put it government, it's not so much as the state. If, if you go into the finer nuances, state will become more important and larger than everything else because we still, you know, the world is still living under the systems of nation state. So let's not, I mean, I'm not going into whether nation state is a good theory or not, but that is our current regime. But you need that protection against the government. What has happened over the years is, and that has happened without, I think, anybody taking note of, is the courts are increasingly becoming the platforms for protecting the government against the citizen. So, so if there is a 50-50 case and there's a revenue involved, you will always find in the last 20-30 years that the courts will tilt towards the state that it's a question of a revenue of the state and go against the citizen. And when I say citizen, I'm including all persons. The companies are also you know, persons. They're technically not citizens, but they have rights like, like most citizens. I mean, I'm not talking of just fundamental rights, but everything else. It's if as, as children and as parents, we would have both, you know, at, at, in, in both formats, you would have seen when, you know, two small children, you know, end up fighting and they go to the parents to resolve their dispute. You normally would ask the elder one to say that, give it up. Because you know, even if whether it is wrong or right, the younger one or the smaller one can't sustain the, the largeness or, the, or, the, uh, or whatever the situation calls for. And the, and the elder brother can. He can give it up. He can sustain even if it is sort of unjust. From, it is from that. It is not that the parent is siding with the older brother. It is not that the parent is, is biased towards the older. As, as kids, we always thought that, you know, the parents are biased towards the younger children. But as parents, you would know they're not biased. It's there for all their protection because that means a protection. So here, normally, it's the government which is the big brother. And it is the citizen who is the younger, uh, younger sibling. And, uh, and, and, a, and an older sibling can sustain a loss even if it is unjust and uncalled for. A younger one can't because he doesn't have the capacity to sustain that. So the idea should be that if a citizen is against the government, and even if there's the slightest of doubt or slightest of, of a case in his favor that the government might be wrong, in my opinion, it is the judicial system has to work in a fashion that it, it sides with the citizen, it protects the citizen, even if it entails a collective loss of an exchequer or, or, or a collective loss. Because a small one can't sustain. And why it is important is that only then the citizen would have a trust and faith in the judicial system that howsoever small a thing may be, howsoever um, a, a minor right I may have, or even if I'm partially correct and not entirely, I will be protected against the state. And, and, and even if it entails a loss, for that immediate case to the state, but in a larger picture, it's much better because people will have trust and faith. At the end of the day, the power that you need, whether it's a, the government or the state or the, or the judicial system, whatever, an officer, is because people have trust and faith in them. If, you know, 100 million people are going to come to state and, and, and want to, you know, badger away a government or, a, or, or any, any official system, that could be done in a minute. They don't do it because they have trust and faith in those systems that it is for their own good. If it is for their own good, it has to be for the protection of the citizen against the government and not the other way around. The governments have been represented the way they have been. And we have seen that what happens is because of, of, of the whole mindset of that the government is about collective country and a collective uh, a, a revenue body which is built of all of us, it needs protection because one individual should not gain at the cost of, of a public good or a public body or a public uh, largesse. But in that process, we forget that unless you give that protection to an individual, let him, uh, even if he can show the slightest of his right, not, not entirely, he has to be protected against the government for that faith. Because what is happening is, as we are losing faith 
in the ability of the judicial system to go against the government and i'm not talking in terms of a of a political going against the government i'm saying in terms of a general dispute the tendency of protecting the government against the citizen has to not be there because if that happens then you've lost the third function of the judiciary in a democracy that it is for the protection of the citizen against the government that is the whole purpose of the judicial system if you do it other way around i'm not getting into the debate whether it is required or not required but just see what happens to the whole function that you entrusted to the judicial system for a democracy to succeed the primary uh, uh, a purpose of a judicial system is to protect the citizen against the government because all the other functions anybody can do as a neutral person is not required you don't require a judicial system you know we have arbitration we've experimented with we had panchayats all of them decide anybody who understand who's got common sense can actually decide dispute dispute between two citizens it's not it's not rocket science but going against deciding things against the government is extremely complex and difficult because there is a a public interest versus an individual interest but if we look at it from the perspective of an individual interest to be safe and i'm not going into the environmental issues like public goods because that is for the existence of the humanity i'm talking of of the of the day to day you know whether it is contractual or it is service or whatever it is against the government uh, uh, environmental issues are, are very different because that falls on the existence of the of the humanity itself so they can't be dealt with in a similar manner they are above any government or any citizen but as far as other things are concerned the primary purpose being uh, protection of the citizen because if 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 you take out this feature of a democracy what is the difference between a democracy and any other form of governance nothing because whatever the government does is right and they are, they are normally doing it for the their whole vision is it is for the betterment of the country it is not that governments even if it is a non democratic government it doesn't want anything bad to come upon for the country but the question is whether this is what we want whether the citizens want to live in a in a freer society and that happens and that is what 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 we want and and common consensus has been again not going into that debate that a uh, a uh, a pure play democracy or or if you don't want that a social democracy is possibly the best form of governance that the world has seen so far that civilization has seen so far so why do we want to take away its distinguishing it is not the elections which make a true democracy elections will only help you elect a government what makes a true democracy is how the government functions and whether its citizens are protected from the government even if i have elected them so what the fundamental mistake we make is that because we are electing a government it's a full democracy no i have strong reservation against that sense that especially as lawyers we must understand that is not what the political theory is what makes a democracy is your participation and your protection against the government and not the manner in which you choose you could elect a king also who says no but would that be a democracy you could elect an oligarchy would that be a democracy no so the distinguishing feature is that there are checks and balances and safeguards created for citizens against the government whether it is elected or otherwise and that the only mechanism is the judicial system and that is why the whole debate on whether the government should take up adjudicating a judicial function on its own which has been happening for the last two three decades is it a good trend or not that's meant for a separate debate but the point i'm trying to make is that the sole distinguishing feature of a true democracy is a judicial or a mechanism an adjudication mechanism which protects you against the government and that is what needs protection we need to have a robust mechanism and for that we need to realize that the citizen has to be protected against the government and not the other way around even if it entails some bruising of the government some wrong wrong uh, uh, sort of uh, doing with the government but they can sustain it imagine it's a simple principle we see it all in in civil cases and injunction balance of convenience right that even if whatever finally it may happen it but today if a happens there is no recourse back if b happens you have a recourse back so then give an injunction for a b thing or not give an injunction for the b thing. it's 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 a simple situation like that so that was what uh, i always you know believed in that uh, uh, 
uh, we as part of the judicial system, whether as, uh, as officers or lawyers or advisors or uh, support staff of the judicial system, um, we play an extremely important role for keeping the flag of the democracy high. As, as young lawyers, I think you should realize that and you should fight for it. Fight for how a citizen ought to be protected against the government. Tweet anyone. It's not about this or that. Uh, when I say government, it means any any decision making one. I mean that's uh, that's. I could be you know misinterpreted when I say government with with whatever is the elected government of the day. No, it's about whoever is the decision making authority. It could be a functionary of the government. Uh, we we use the term government as a collective word for anything who is entrusted with the decision making as well as uh, a law making. So that's uh, that's my take on it. Thank you so much, sir, there for your valuable insights. Now, uh, uh, talking about cross-border education. Now, uh, in the experiences that every person should go through, if you could, if you could throw some light on what cross-border education is all about, how, and how it helps an individual in character building or becoming a, a, a seasoned professional. If you could, if you could highlight that, sir. So, you know, uh, I've always, so when we talk of cross-border specialization or cross-border education or a cross-border experience, it's not about the political borders, uh, no Indo-Pak experience. It's about uh, expertise or learning or experiences in, on, in different subjects or different aspects of uh, not just um, a professional uh, lawyer uh, that a professional lawyer comes across, but generally uh, a learning that is available through uh, experiences and education. So, you know, um, so you could be an engineer and a lawyer, both together and you practice, decide to practice either as a, or work as an engineer or a lawyer, but you're cross-border specialized, you've got two specializations and you could be multi-border specialization. You could be, you know, more than that as well. Why is it important and how it helps? I mean, uh, it's a it's a uh, uh, more on a question of training, but you know to give more to give it the perspective of um, it's about multiple perspectives. I don't know if you've seen the movie Vantage Point. You know the same scene is is sort of reconstructed from completely different perspectives, and you see the whole story is changed. And uh, you know, uh, and you know, I'm a man of story. You know, I like more stories than anything else. Um, how you look at different things from different perspectives make a lot of differences. So, you know, let me give you two, three things and then we'll sort of join the dots. So, you know, law essentially, what's the domain of law? It gives the regulatory framework for regulating the various aspects of, of life, whether it's liberty or trade or commerce or disputes, whatever. Uh, it's part of governance. And uh, law is a superstructure which regulates the underlying foundation, uh, foundational subject. So unless you understand the foundation, it's difficult that you will be you do justice by being an architect only of the superstructure. So let me give an example. So today, um, um, uh, you want to do say uh, law, which is practices on patent uh, engineering patents. So if you have a background or an understanding or learning, it may not be formal training of physics and engineering, you would be far better equipped to understand, deconstruct, and then address the legal issue that arises out of disputes which are essentially embedded in that, in that invention, which is an engineering invention. So somebody who doesn't understand the engineering invention will, will not be able to see uh, the the whole construct of that dispute from the perspective of what it is required for. At the end of the day, we are only solution providers, right? We, uh, because there is a dispute with respect to an engineering invention between two persons or whoever it could be, we want a resolution unless we understand that invention itself, will we be able to do justice to the legal construct that is around it? Or for example, uh, uh, you want to do um, uh, a, a criminal, you, you're practicing as a criminal lawyer and especially on bodily injuries uh, subjects. And 
And uh, so every other day you will have a forensic issue coming up, whether it is in form of a report or a test. So if you understand the forensic science or you're trained as in, in, that, in that field, I mean, it need not be again a formal training, but if you understand that subject, your approach and your understanding of the legal implications that come out of, of such issues would be far better and your resolution would be, you know, more, uh, 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 would be more complete if I may use that word. You know, how you look at a fact situation or how you look at a problem makes a difference in the outlook and the disputes. Mostly it's not about being right or wrong. You know, as lawyers, we understand most cases are not about right or wrong. We are talking about interpretation of issues. So they're not about right or wrong. It's about your right versus my right or your wrong versus my wrong. It's about how you perceive that thing. So if you are used to perceive things only from a singularity, if you're trained only in one subject, if you are if you're trained to sort of uh, uh, see perceive things from a singularity, it will always be in the domain of a unidimensional assessment. And a unidimensional assessment is, 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 uh, uh, is dangerous. Uh, as school students, whenever you, know, you would recall us uh, studying uh, you know, in, in literature class, they would give you a paragraph and questions. And they would ask you questions and then say that this, the questions have to be answered in reference to context. Now, without that reference to context, the question is meaningless a lot of times. So similarly, if you are perceiving a situation only from a singularity and, and do not have a plural perception, you may arrive at a completely different uh, uh, assessment. And we've seen that because say, for example, if you um, let me also, uh, I'll give you a, 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 a classic, a kind of a WhatsApp joke example, right? You know, there's a, Somebody who was, you know, going on a motorbike carrying sand across the borders, the political borders, and he suddenly stopped at the borders. He's going from India to Pakistan, and they say, "What is it that you are carrying?" He said, "I'm carrying sand." So obviously they're laughing. Are you joking? I mean, why would you be carrying sand from here to there? So they detain him, beat him up, send the thing for testing, and figure out, "Oh, it is sand." Over. So they have to release him. This happens again 15 days later. They again hold him up, beat him up, ask questions, send it for testing. It's sand. There's nothing else other than sand. And this keeps on happening. And then, you know, after a point of time, they stop stopping him. And he continues like this. You know, a few years go by and the, and the person who's in charge, you know, is sitting on the other side in a city in a cafe where our chap lands up for a cup of coffee. And he says, uh, bhai, you know, now I'm retired. So there's nothing I can do against you. But I'm sure you're doing something wrong. What was it that you were doing? We couldn't catch you for so long. He said, yes, you're right. I was smuggling. He says, what? We checked out. Why would you smuggle sand in this country? He said, no, I wasn't smuggling sand. I was smuggling motorbikes. So, you know, when, when it's a question of how, if you're, if you look at something from a singularity, you'll always be, always be looking at only the sand. And don't think out of the box to say that, no, it's not sand. It could be the motorbike itself that he's, he's uh, smuggling, right? And that is why if you have to be an entrepreneur, think like an entrepreneur, that is when you'll be able to find solutions. You have to think like an entrepreneur, you know, uh, what is creativity and what does it consist of, especially for us as lawyers, you know, we are not into fine art or, or, or creating a physical thing. So, you know, it is about when seeing what everyone else has seen, you know, the papers are the same, the issue is same, everybody has seen the papers. So seeing what everyone else has seen, thinking what no one else has thought so far. That's where the first step comes in. Everybody is seeing the same thing, but you are thinking something which is nobody else has thought of. And where the good from the great separates is, is then doing what no one else has dared to do. So you've thought about something, but you've gone ahead and then challenged it or defended it or advised about it. And that is why you'll find how great cases come across, the great stories that, 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 that come across. Whether you lose or win a battle in a courtroom is, is not really the lawyer's domain. His domain is to be able to think what no one else has thought and to be able to do what no one else has dared, come out with that creative solution. And you know, 
uh, when I when I talk of this, you know, I always uh, 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 talk in terms of uh, giving those parallel examples, and I can give you some. I can go endlessly on this, but uh, let's see. You know, there's a, this. Uh, this is again these are anecdotes which you find everywhere. But just to explain, drive home the point of how multiple perspectives change. So this is a this is a huge, large one of the top Fortune 500 companies on logistics side, and back in the day, they were considered to be a dirty industry. In that industry, one of the Fortune 500 companies is known for its ethical standards and integrity. So its CEO is always called, the founder is always called to you know, train. And one of his training sessions, you know, is people said that what are the secrets of the success? I mean, in this industry, what have you and what we should be doing? He said, nothing, you just need integrity and wisdom. You know, saying these two words are one thing and explaining them is another. He was asked to explain. So he said there are always two things. One character trait without the other will be you'll be worse off than not having that character trait. So integrity is, you know, if you make a promise, then you have to make good, uh, even if it entails a loss to you, however difficult it might be. You know, so we find you know a lot of times there are pressure on a lawyer to say that oh, surely you should be able to win it for us, or and all of us know that nothing is in our hands. But you know, but but the integrity is if you've committed, he said, then what, what is wisdom? This wisdom is not to make those promises. So if you are able to do that, then you know, so that is how these are two different, unless you see the same thing from different perspectives, you will not be able to have a holistic view of it. And this is what happens. Integrity might end up make, you know, uh, will take you nowhere unless you also have the wisdom to be able to guide you of, of what to commit and what not to commit. You know, similarly, you have, uh, 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 you know, uh, it's again a perception we have as a classic case, you know, we always everywhere we'll find a statue of, of justice, which is blind, right? And I think, uh, uh, um, um, uh, justice, um, um, uh, one of the, I'm, I'm forgetting, I'm slipping off my mind, the name of the one who had written in his memoirs that, you know, what is, uh, is justice blind? So um, he says, yes, justice is blind. Justice ought to be blind, but it ought to be blind to prejudices, not knowledge and not facts. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, we end up uh, discussing on that the court doesn't know. Well, the court is supposed to know it is that they are only to be blind to prejudices, not fact and reality and knowledge. And why is it important is that we need to make a differentiation between knowledge and opinion. If you have an opinion, you have no business to carry it, it, it um, as an adjudicating officer in court because that is bias. It's your opinion. But, if you, but knowledge is something which you must always have. And as officers of court, lawyers, should always also have that. Even if they're holding a brief of, with someone, they should know everything about the case, but they can't hold an opinion. They have to argue in their cases. So, you know, uh, so the example that I'd given was on, you know, lateral thinking, how lateral thinking is so important. And, uh, and you also have, you know, there's another interesting, you know, curiosity and perception. We talk of, um, when, when something comes up, you know, when a topic of papers come to you, you should always be curious. And uh, you should always be able to uh, find uh, answers to it. Why is it important is that, uh, uh, you know, somebody asked, you know, a small child was asking a lot of questions to his father and saying, you know, he was sort of irritating him. So the father, you know, sort of rebukes him and says, do you know what would have happened to me if I had asked so many questions to my father back in the day? You know, he was, so the son very immediately responds, you know, if you had asked so many questions to your father, you would have had answers to mine. So, you know, that's that's why you must always be curious. But curiosity is again has to be tempered with perception of how you frame a question. So I think we are running out of time. I'll just I'll just talk of two things on this and possibly we'll we'll end a note. So this this gentleman who's going on a on a road trip, I think possibly like me. And he comes across a stream where he wants, he's not sure whether he should take in his Jeep or not. So he waits, a farmer comes across from a nearby village and he asks him that, you know, uh, is, is the water deep? So the farmer says, no, not really. 
and he walks off. The gentleman, you know, takes his jeep in the water and lo and behold, there's too much water. It sinks him, his car stops and he's stranded. He's furious. You know, he comes back in the evening when the farmer is returning back, he's still waiting there for help. And he's curious and asks the farmer that, what wrong did I do that you lied to me? Why did you say something wrong and the water was so deep? So the farmer says, well, I never lied. And I don't think the water is deep. Every day my ducks cross the stream and the water only comes halfway up there. So, you know, that's a perception. The man has only seen that. So if, when, when the question that should have been asked was, how deep is the water? You know, the actual answer of what's the depth of the water and not really whether it is deep or not deep. So more often, the solution does not lie in the answers that you try to find out. It lies in the question that you raise. If you raise the right question, you will be able to find a solution. As lawyers, I think our primary duty is to find solutions and not just, uh, uh, you know, uh, find answers to things. Um, and then you have to do it with consistency. So, you know, when uh, uh, Christopher McDougall was writing on super athletes of Africa, you know, suddenly everybody woke up, you know, that all the Africans are, 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 are winning all the athlete, athletic events, especially long distance, etc. Where does this trend come from? So they were doing the study on it way back. And, you know, while he was writing the book, he was one of the things he observed was that, you know, it's, it's not so much about of how much inherent talent or something that you have. It's a consistency that, that plays a more important role. And he says that in Africa, you know, every day in the morning, a lion and a gazelle wakes up. The gazelle, when he wakes up, he knows that he has to run faster than the lion so that he's not eaten up. But it doesn't end there. Even the lion is stressed every morning. And he knows that unless he runs faster than the slowest of the gazelles, he won't, he will go hungry. And it has to be done every day. And if you do it every day and you do it with consistency, then you know uh, 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 it, it it will lead to all of all of that with us. I don't know if you've run out of time. Uh, no, sir, uh, so talking about uh, how important is uh... so can you hear me hello yes yes absolutely i can yeah. hear you so if you could if you could slightly elaborate on the importance of multitasking you know in a legal practitioner's life uh, first of all are you in favor of it are you against it is it good or bad and if yes then how does one multitask because you've been doing that as your as per your profile <laughs> I don't know if it's good or bad. I'm, you know, there's always there's a never-ending debate on this whether multitasking is good or it's bad. People who can do it or can't do it. I have two, three things, and then you know, you you have a takeaway on it. You know, we think that the computers multitask, right? But actually, they don't. You know, they are also they work for the zero and one. What they do is that you know, if you always have a a breathing time between the two events of a single task. So they don't waste that time and use that to do another task of another event. And, and, and so at any given point of time, you're only doing one which will focus, but you don't, you utilize the time which is in between. And you're able to do that. I think you can multitask even as a, as a professional and as lawyers, I think we get ample opportunity to do that. Especially if you're a litigating lawyer, you have to wait in courts, you have to, uh, you know, uh, wait in between conferences, uh, you are moving around. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not that you do two things simultaneously, but you're able to use your time and not wait for one task to finish while you take up another. It's just a mindset issue. I think it can be done and all of us should be doing it. Why should we not read, a, you know, uh, if you're fond of reading uh, something on fiction while you're waiting for your matters to come up? I'm just randomly giving an example. And then, you know, that's multitasking A. B also what happens is, that you'll be able to do different things if you are, if you, as I, you know, I go back to that cross-border thing that, that you have multiple uh, backgrounds. So you see things differently. So just to give you an example, how uh, a man of literature will see law, will we see, he'll see something like when he reads a Merchant of Venice, uh, Shakespeare, right? It's got more legal issues than you can imagine. Uh, how would a um, uh, a man of a, a sportsman like me would see see law through which lens. So every day, you know, there are issues on doping and 
and and and uh, you know things like that with or or uh, contracts of sportsmen etc. And you see it from that lens. How would a man of capital markets or finance see? He will possibly see those legal issues through the lens of of the various scams or fundraising that's do. You know, Bombay High Court for 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 more than a decade had a special court dedicated to just the security scam of 1992. Or or how would a, a man of somebody who 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 studies uh, or who you know is is sort of well versed with philosophy and jurisprudence with with look. Uh, 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 will uh, will look uh, will look at law. Uh, I leave a thought um, um, experiment with you at the end of this, and and leave you with it, which is which will show you how I mean will will we'll make you realize how somebody from a philosophy background or a jurisprudential background will look at uh, legal issues, or how would a a student of history look at law? He will look at the various international treaties or. Or how those treaties were broken, which led to war, or what were war treaties, and that's also law. But you see from the lens of of something else. The minute you start looking a particular problem from multiple lenses, you obviously have uh, a multiple perceptions. And the minute you are able to do that, you'll also be able to multitask. And when I say multitask, I really don't mean to say you do two things simultaneously. I mean to say you do multiple things in your life. You know, life is too um, too precious to be uh, you know not be open to many things. You know, whatever humanity has to offer, whether it is in terms of things that you should be doing for others, or whether it is for your own enjoyment, or whether it is for a passion that you need to follow. And they all can be done while we are effective counselors. It's not that you can't do that. It doesn't. You know, being a counselor doesn't mean you have no other life. Unless you are a happy soul, you won't be a good counsel. Unless your passion is alive, you won't be a good counsel. You know, as the saying goes, a Google can tell you what profession to have, an answer to any question, or even today, you know, you can even search your life partners through Google. But a Google cannot tell you what is what what passion is bubbling inside you and what will drive you. That is when you are open to all of these things. You will, you will be a. If you are, if you are a happier human being, you are going to be a better counselor. You will do better justice to your clients, and you will be do, you will do better assistance to court. So, just to give you an example, I leave it. I mean, we may not end it. I mean, I'm just saying that I leave this. It's a centuries-old uh, 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 thought experiment, and there are no clear answers to it. I think Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher, had had really um, uh, you know expounded on this. So supposing, and this is a question which comes in. Supposing there is a uh, a railway track which is closed, and there is a there are five people playing on it, and then there is a railway track which is working, and everybody knows that a train is going to come in, and there's one person who's who's walking on it. He doesn't know he is oblivious to what a train is coming. Now suddenly a train comes. The person who's manning the railway station has an option: either he can't stop the train. So either he lets because there's no signal there. He either lets the train go straight, which means that one person was uh, uh, sorry. There are five persons there. Sorry, I'm there. Five persons are there. The one person is there on a track which is abandoned. So the the uh, choice with the person is with the railway uh, station manager is that either he lets the train go on its scheduled path, five people will be killed, or he can change the track. Of the train, he can't stop the train, and it will go on the track which is abandoned, where one person is there and he's playing it. And he will be. It's a it's a very gory kind of an example, but it really opens up. As lawyers, we should see. So, what should he be doing? The utilitarian principle says that you should save the five for the one. But what Kant says is. That the mistake was done by those five people. They were there on a light track. They should have known that they should not go there. The one person who's there on a on an abandoned track has made no mistake. So why should even one person pay the price for the mistake of of the other five? There are, I, as you would understand, there can't be an answer to this. But there's a debate that's going on. But in real life policy making, in real governance, you know. Uh, we we were earlier talking about the government you know citizen to be protected against the government but see the challenge the government faces every day it has to take decisions which will entail situations like this and how will they decide it's easy to challenge them it's easy to criticize them 
but it's very difficult to take the decision and that is why the role of courts is even more important now i go beyond saying it is not just about protecting the citizen against the government it's about taking a call on which principle we will follow for governance at a given point in time and what will govern everyone else because that challenge will something like this obviously whatever the the railway manager decides somebody will challenge it on the other side right and it has they have good arguments for that but it's the adjudicating forum which you have to decide that and 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 that's so that is why i say if you if you to bring all of this together if you have multiple perceptions you will be able to do multiple things and if you are able to do multiple things while you're pursuing big whatever your core professional thing is i think you will be more complete you will have more empathy even as a as a as a as a lawyer you will understand and once you know two perceptions you understand that there are more than one perception you understand plurality when you understand plurality you know that it could be seen from very many angles and you are but one of the right things you are not the only right person in the room and that's uh, i think that's extremely important you know it's a very uh, famous quote of john rawls uh, uh, you know uh, who's who's always talked of justice as fairness Uh, and in his theory of justice he says that uh, uh, the way things are does not determine the way they ought to be and i think that is why you know if we if we know that we can be a creative best and always keep challenging ourselves and everything else that is around us for for a better outcome and an outcome Thank you so much, there, sir. Uh, we can go on and on with this session. Uh, lastly, sir, was one last question because I'm too tempted to ask this. I just cannot refrain myself from doing so. Uh, if we can end this by answering this question, that how important it is for a lawyer to have this student in him alive. Uh, maybe see so many legal practitioners who are not very active on the academic front, and you've been an academician all your life. You've pursued so many courses. You've done so many specializations. Is it the passion or the fire in belly that keeps you going? Or is it something that everybody should have? How does how does a lawyer keep himself active on the academic front, and how important is for a legal practitioner to do so? I think uh, you know, um, uh, uh, as they say, that uh, there is no uh, situation as uh, as uh, uh, being in a consistent state of affairs. You either grow or you die out. the only constant is change so unless the student in me is alive i really won't be able to grow i mean i'm not even talking of whether i'll be better as a lawyer or not that comes much later but just as a person and unless i grow i will not be able to translate it to my work and you know as i said the next generation uh, will always stand on the shoulders of the last one because they learn from the experience of the other one if i am able to keep alive the student in me and keep learning new things maybe i'll also be able to stand on my own shoulders when i say my own shoulders mane the, the generation that i am on and be able to see and peep into the future be a little better at what uh, what we do and also be able to share the vision of uh, uh, of of the next learning that has come in whether it is through a person or otherwise so if i if i want to do that um, we are all students for life i mean there can't be a single minute where i mean why will not be students for life do you, do we wish to stop learning or do we wish to kill the curiosity in us or do we wish to kill the creativity in us or do we wish to Uh, uh stop wanting more out of 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 everything in life uh, why would i not want to be a student i would always want to be a student and as long as um uh, you know i i uh, it's it's a very uh, uh, interesting uh, thing that you know if you it's an old um, uh, saying and uh, i don't know i normally always have it on my system but i don't know if i have it uh, right now but it goes like this that you know if if uh, you can't explain it it's an old saying if you can't explain it uh um if you can't explain it to a child you've not understood it 
and if you can't explain in simple terms it's not science so first you have to understand it make it simple and be able to teach it only then you are a complete student you understood it understood it with clarity so so you know that process should always be be on i think uh, uh, we should always have that process uh, going on so thank you so much there for your valuable insights sir uh, well the banner says celebrating the 50th episode you made our segment memorable and uh, any parting words uh, congratulations to you and i think it's an honor uh, to be you know on a landmark episode i don't know if uh, you know i justify being here or not but i have had a thoroughly memorable and enjoyable evening with you chatting with you and knowing what you've been doing i think it's a it's a great uh, initiative all of us uh, would be happy to participate in whichever way we can and contribute always happy to have a chat with you thank you so much sir all the best for the i hope to you know see uh, the 500th episode oh my uh, in near future we would love to have you for the 500th episode as well sir <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much there thank you so much it was a pleasure sir thank you so much for time thank you so much uh, so to all the viewers stay tuned next episode is on its way it, it's goodbye for now thank you sir thank you.